cool. Let's have our, our guests come back. So Kathy and Angela can come back and we can, uh, you know, have a conversation with our attendees. Let's see. I'm so pleased that, you know, we've, we've had uh, two people come with us, Kathy and Angela, from very different artistic backgrounds, but still sharing the same convictions about finding their voice and finding their passion and staying true to those kinds of things and being um, people who have who have I won't I won't say the word pioneers that has problematic connotations but who have you know pushed the boundaries I don't know, I don't know what the bright metaphor is for for the things that people are doing but it's great that people are choosing their own uh, their own ways forward so uh, Philip did you pick a question first from uh, from the audience questions oh um welcome back y'all uh, I think the first question it says for Angela but I, I kind of want to pitch it to both of y'all like what's what's the grind like for y'all and how do you balance that like your horizon grind with your creativity right like how does that make sense for you in, in your work um especially as uh, your path is something many young creatives who need to pave their way have to consider right for I think both of y'all in, in your respective ways but I'll, I'll pass it to Angela first okay sure thanks um you know I think it's, it's busy, right? Full-time job, um, writing on the side, doing a lot of other things, um, volunteering, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you fit it in? Um, I think if you love what you do, you make time for it. So, you know, you can say you're busy for a lot of things, but I think if it's important to you, you, you make the time and you move things around. Um, you know, I would love to write, I, you know, I mentioned it before, I would love to write full-time. It's just not there yet. Um, and not a place where I can actually do that. I still love my consulting job in a way. And um, so, you know, you just have to learn to balance it, make time for things you love, people you love, and just grind it out. Um, you know, that you always hear the story of the starving artist, right? I can't be starving. I love food too much. So, you know, I have a full-time job to pay the bills and feed myself. And I let um, my creativity just be free to create versus choosing it or making it pay the bills, right? Because then it might, it might force me to, or I might be inclined to write stories I think the market would like, but I would prefer to write stories that I want to tell. Um, and I always have to worry is, oh, how well will it do in the marketplace? Um, so, you know, just making time for things you love um, and just doing it. I think just no excuses. Happy. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. If when you love something, you make it work, you make it happen. Um, it's definitely very, very hard <laughs> um, mm -hmm. for me with like the time zones um, and um, also dealing um, with just like responsibilities as a mom and it's it's hard. Um, but you know, when we created this, um, this brand and this business, like we created it for like the long term. And so for us, like, we know that it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. Like, it's not about like quick returns. It's about creating like, you know, long lasting values and vision. And so just have to keep, you know, reminding um, myself that, you know, when the times are tough. I've put the, well, we have questions for both of you specifically, but uh, for, for, for uh, Kathy, I put um, the Garam.com website in the, uh, the q and I'm sorry, the q and or the chat, or the chat, so people can go look at it right now and see some of what we've been talking about, but we have some specific questions for you from Linda Nguyen. Uh, one question that Linda asks is, and I think she's referring to what's on the site, I can see that your new style, I'm not sure which catalog that's referring to, but is abstract and flowy and has layers like the Aoyai. Does it take you a long time to deconstruct or make it into a new concept? Um... I think, well, for us, um, we, we've always incorporated the Aoyai in our collections from the beginning. Um, it, you know, just again, the idea of the dress and the pant. Um, and for us, like the creating of the Aoyai itself is the construction. Like it's not necessarily the look, but how we make it is what makes it an Aoyai. Um, and so, and that's a very natural process because that's how we built our production, like the, in terms of like how we hand finish everything. And so for us, it's, was, it's very organic for us to like incorporate um, styles that are um, Aoyai inspired or are Aoyais. Um, and um, 
you know, and we, yeah, we try to style it in different ways. And so that you can start to begin to imagine that you can wear it, you know, outside of the wedding or you know, graduation. Now, I'm looking at the spring summer 2023 catalog and I can say, I, I can totally see people going to the beach, hang out at home on the patio in a bar, all this kind of stuff. I don't see people cooking. I think you mentioned that they could cook. <laughs> and the, I, I don't know. I there, There's an apron. <laughs> we have aprons. <laughs> yeah. an apron, right. Okay, sure. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, one more thing from Linda. She has a question about the colors. Uh, colors are landscape-like. Are these influenced by the country of Vietnam or is it for environmental reasons? I guess more broadly, you know, where do the colors come from? And, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about the technical process of how these colors come about. Yeah, so our, our colors tend to be um, earth tones and we'll have like a, a pop of color every now and then. Um, all of our prints are actually all designed um, by us and inspired by nature. Um, we, we have a little studio garden in Vietnam where we kind of tend to gardens and actually the, the print that I'm wearing now is orchid roots. Um, and so um, the, the concept of it is um, in, our, in our garden, we would tend to uproot the orchids and kind of wrap them around like broken ceramic pieces. And, you know, over time, like they will start to kind of grow and kind of mend around this like new place kind of finding like a new belonging. And so for us, it's basically a dedication to our families being like uprooted and rerooted and, you know, just planting themselves. Um, and so our the print, the orchid print that's new for spring, summer um, wraps around your body when you wear it. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, creates a home on you, but mm. yeah, very nature driven. Passing it also to to Angela. We and you know we didn't get a chance to see some of the illustrations from Finding Papa uh, earlier in the show. But if you would you be down to screen share and share some with our audience, or just hold up the book that, that or you... hold up the book, yeah, whatever you have ready. Oh, you're muted. You muted, Angela. We're talking about how this feels like a work meeting. Yeah, right? story of my life of every meeting I've been to. <laughs> okay, so. Um, I do want to show the cover. I feel like, gosh, the cover is so beautiful and the colors are so rich. Um, you know, really, I mean, truly, that's how my mom, you know, uh, went on to the boat that was in the river. I mean, she couldn't swim and the water was like up to her neck and I'm like on top of her shoulders and she has one small bag. So it's just very powerful um, imagery here um, of my and her mom and, and, I mean, there are so many beautiful illustrations, but um, Ooh. well, you know, what's interesting is that it's also a very different illustrating style than I think what T did for the best we could do, or also uh, a different pond. So that's also interesting that um, her collaboration with you prompted a whole new illustrative style. Happen. I'm not even touching anything. <laughs> so this is like when they get on the boat, and then she looks for her papa on the boat. You know, she's looking down into the ship. Oh, wow. uh, you know, the, the like the papa, hole. The hole, right? The bottom of the ship. So for the, it's hard to see with the lights, but yeah, it's just so powerful. Um, and her colors are just so rich. Uh, but just super proud of this book. Um, so. Would you like to see more? Are you? <laughs> well, yeah, let's see. You tried a chicken with just chicken. You tried a version with just chickens, and the editors were not convinced. <laughs> uh, yeah, where are the chickens in, in this? There was a scene where Mai is saying goodbye to her home, <laughs> so she hugs a mango tree and, and kisses her chicken. <laughs> so there's a, a chicken scene in there, um, but yeah, just her colors are amazing. Um, you know, people on the boat. Um, who are also underneath that boat with my and her mama. Um, just, you know, pictures, colors, you know, tea like really focuses on my mama, whereas the um, the other folks are more like muted colors. Um, when you're saved, you can see it here too, where you can see my and mama mostly and everyone else is kind of muted. But you can see, still see them on the, the boat. But... 
Okay, so um, Kathy, back to you. I, I one of the questions is from uh, Christine Nguyen, who Christine Nguyen and Veth, I'm sorry, who asks which of your piece or pieces would you recommend for a first time Garam buyer? So I was looking through your catalog and I went to best selling Garam classics, and I I'm pretty sure I recognized the setting of the photograph of the first picture that falls under best sellers. Did you go take that photograph at Nguyen Duke's house? in the okay. mountains around Hanoi because <laughs> yeah. I've been to that house um I've been to that house I'll drop the the link into the into the chat but uh yeah I've been to that house That's actually so cool. our, our only fashion show that we've ever done was actually with him he uh we collaborated with him and produced a, a performance piece um in Hanoi maybe in 2014 or so um but yeah, we yes. haven't any other shows. We're talking to the original Vietnamese diasporic bohemian uh, yeah. master, <laughs> uh, Nguyen Duc, uh, who was- Did he all found version. Divan at his house? He, he founded the original version of Divan uh, when I was a college student. Um, and then, you know, he was an NPR journalist and he, he moved back to Vietnam and started, you know, bars and restaurants and, and all of that, but also built this fabulous house in um, in the mountains outside of Hanoi. And so if you go to the first image on the link I just put in there of Garam Classics, you will see the view from the top of Duke's house in the mountains of Dam Dao, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, the question from Christine is, uh, for the first time buyer, what what might be a place to start? And I'll look, try to look it up and drop the link in the uh, the chat. Yeah, it would be the, the triangle dress, um, the the very dress that's in that photo <laughs> um, at Winky Duke's house. Um, the triangle dress was actually our first design and it's um, just constructed with two pieces of fabric. So the natural drape creates that uh, triangle opening um, and it's been with our collection for 10 years now and we yeah. make it in different colors. We've seen, we've seen customers wear it as their wedding dress, their city hall dress. Um, we've seen it on um, women speaking in friend of um, conferences. We've seen it casually with sneakers. It's very versatile. So that's definitely. <laughs> On this description in the link I just sent you, it says model is five feet eight wearing size small. By Vietnamese standards, that's a size large, I believe. Well, um, our our sizing is really just based on the shoulders. It, you're, they're fit for the shoulders and it drapes on your body. So actually like a size small would fit an extra small to a, a medium, you know, um, but yeah. Cool. Philip, back to you. Back to me. Okay. Um, I want to uh, pitch this question to both of y'all. It's from Dawn Jang Fang. Um, they mentioned, I love Kathy's idea of un a unisex LEI. Unisex is comfortable and still elegant. I'd like to ask if Kathy sees in the past the burden of preservation of clothes, clothing tradition on women's shoulders, which is not always comfortable. Kind of want to modify that, uh, pitch that one to Kathy. And then for Angela, like, do you feel the weight or um, like obligation to tell like refugee stories in your work too? <clears throat> or, you know, yeah, pass to you, Kathy. Yeah, um, I, I guess I don't really see it as an obligation. Um, I see it more of as a celebration um, and and then for our guys, I guess we're we're taking it again back to like the original guys. It's very loose for me, <laughs> and so um, you know we love to embrace that um, that aoyai, um because it is comfortable. And so we kind of hope that we can introduce that type of aoyai, um more in this kind of aoyai market, you know, where it's a lot is has been known for like the more form fitting. Um, so yeah. What do you, what about you, Angela? Do you feel any type of burden? Yeah, no, not at all. I feel like it's an ode, you know, like uh, Kathy said, celebration ode to our families to like, for me, my parents and the brave men and women out there who took this trip and it's, you know, um, celebration of their courage and remembering what people went through. So it's really an honor and a privilege to be able to write a story like that. Um, because I think a lot of, as we're here in a first world country, sometimes I think we forget how we've gotten here. Um, so no, it's really been a great 
privilege to be able to share stories and really broaden the knowledge um, for others who are non-Vietnamese and who never experienced something like this, who are non-immigrant. Thank you for that. And then another question from Kim Kim Nguyen, Kim Nhat, or Nhat Nguyen. They said that they've been writing children's book in their journal and will probably write another after this gathering. Oh, nice. Um, do you have any <laughs> advice on next steps? And for Angela, and then we'll pass it to Via after too, as you know, writer extraordinaire as well. So, so next so steps for, in writing? Yeah, so, so like if they've got something in their journal, they've been writing these children's yeah. books, like how do you get a children's book published? Sure, I think you have to, uh, for me personally, I really put myself out there, you know, join social, um, you know, Twitter is a mess right now, but when I joined um, the writing communities on Twitter, you know, other writers, um, agents, editors, and I just went out there and just learned and followed people and, and you know, read their, uh, what they were competitions and contests that they were joining and how to get mentors and critiques. And so just really learning and um, the process. And so um, put yourself out there. And that's how I was able to like join a contest, got a mentor. She helped me uh, revise Finding Papa. And then I started querying, you know, you do your research and you know, uh, look for agents or, um, and editors, but I think a lot of big publishers prefer you to have an agent to submit your work. So I would say, do your research on agents. Who are the authors, um, illustrators that you admire? Who are they um, repped by, right? Start going out there and learning about people and about who they are and what they're looking for and seeing if you're a fit. Because I think um, finding the right agent for you, um, how they communicate, how they educate, you know, how they edit your work, et cetera, et cetera, is really important because it's hopefully a lifelong partnership and collaboration effort. Um, and then, you know, going out there and you just have to have the courage to start querying and getting rejections um, and being okay with rejections and seeing that as a redirection to something or someone that's more of a fit for you. So um, I think it's about putting your work out there and letting the world receive it. Um, and of course, doing your homework and always doing your research and, you know, start querying and hopefully you can land an agent and hopefully they can submit your stories to the right editors um, who, you know, love and support your work. I put some links in the uh, in the chat. I, I asked my current um, children's book editor uh, if, on behalf of a friend, you know, how do you break into the children's book publishing industry and so on? And so that these are the responses that she that she gave me um, some because I know nothing about the children's book literature world. I just fell into it by accident because of my son Ellison and and his book. And our our book was published. That book was published by McSweeney's, very reputable press, but not a specialist in children's literature. But this next book that I'm doing is being published by what was formerly known as Min Editions in the United States, and it's actually turning into something else. It has a new name. I forget what it is, but I've been so. It's been a new experience for me because working with a, a press that specializes in children's lit, there have been like editorial comments and we've gone back and forth about the prose and the layout and the images and how many pages and the co and the art and the cover art and all these kinds of things. So it's really been a, a fun process. It's been collaborative with the art, but also with the editing process, thinking about how all these different pieces fit together in the layout of the book. So as you can see from what uh, what Angela showed us, you know, it's not just words, it's also images and lettering and coloring and all these kinds of things that have to be figured out and then trying to figure out how big the images are and, and, and all, the, all this kind of stuff, which makes the children's picture book experience quite different than books that only, only have words. Uh, in them, but it's a very fun process as well. But the other thing I learned from from working with with Ellison with, and with children in general is that for me, the biggest uh, thing takeaway that I learned was to always ask the question, why not? Because adults are always, you know, trying to st stop you from doing stuff. You can't do that. That's not reasonable. That would never happen in real life. You know, scale back your ambitions become a doctor, lawyer, engineer, that kind of thing. <laughs> what are you do that as a children's book author or as a fashion designer? And children are like, why not? Why can't we do, why can't chickens become pirates? Mm -hmm. Why can't they? Why not? And so why not is a great question for anybody who's creative, whether you're a children's book writer or illustrator or whether you're fashion designing. Why? I look at, at haute couture fashion shows. I'm like, they clearly ask the question, why not? I don't get it, but that's I, I'm not the audience, so it's not a problem with that. And then, likewise, I I've taken that lesson of why not and transferred it to writing, you know, 
adult books as well. So um, I have a question now for, for Kathy. Uh, so the creative side for fashion, you know, it's interesting. The, the fashions that I see here on the Garam website are very wearable and I, I assume deliberately designed as such. Uh, but do you how do you how do you relate to the 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 high fashion industry, which from my outsider's perspective seems to be about it's not, I'm not denigrating it, it's just, but just doing different things in terms of avant-garde work and experimental work and things like that, but not necessarily wearability for the I don't know if you call them the average person or something, but your your clothing is clearly something that people can just wear on the street. Uh, or at home. Yeah, I mean, I love it, but I also don't follow it. <laughs> um, yeah, I think for us, it's like, that was what we felt was missing was clothing for the everyday or clothing that can be for the everyday, but then you can also wear it for special occasions. Like, you know, that stays very true um, with everything that we design. And we also hope to empower our customers to feel like they could, that they can also wear it with sneakers or they can dress it up. And so I think that's also part of like our role too is getting um, getting our customers to feel comfortable in it. Um, and, you know, I, I think they do. I think they do because our designs are about, it just drapes on their body. I'm going to drop the unisex linen set into the chat since uh, we haven't seen that much so far uh that's not you know um about women's wear from garam but you do have unisex as well okay we've got a couple of back-to-back -back questions for kathy in the q and a <clears throat> um two says kathy would you go on next in fashion shout out to bao mm -hmm. chen goia who has been shout out to goia who has been a guest on the show what is undergrad slash shop my closet slash sass kathy most proud of who you've become today and then the Karam X Viet Tan Win line might be a an email that we send after the show to get Viet you know dressed up for our, our next iteration of Accented. Um no I don't think I would do next fashion. I'm very introverted. <laughs> so not not the not the place for me. Um yeah I think I mean my sask shot my closet me um I think I mean, I'm still striving um, towards, you know, again, it's, I, I feel like everything I'm doing, it's, it's very long term. And I think it's like sticking to my values, what I believe in, um, and stay committed to it. Um, and I think my college self would be proud that um, I stand my ground. Um, and um, hopefully, is someone, I'm someone that they would look up to um, now, but yeah, <laughs> definitely mm, there wasn't someone like me when I was <laughs> like 20 plus years ago. <laughs> word, word. And then um, just kind of one of the questions that we also got in the chat from Isabella Nguyen that I want to pitch to all of y'all is, <clears throat> what has the reception from the old we've been talking a lot about the youth the children the kids the next generation what has there been the re, what has been the reception um from the elder generation for your work um Angela for your children's children's book yeah. right Kathy for your fashion Viet you can talk a little bit about re, re, elder reception for your tv show too that's going to be coming out soon we also want to hear about that but <clears throat> Angela sure um I, I think a lot of uh emotions and crying. I think I've um, had people reach out, you know, on social saying that when they read Finding Papa, it reminded them either of their, um, you know, their journey or of their parents' journey. And so I think a lot of uh, tearing up um, and touched by the story. So um, yeah, I think probably for folks who've gone through um, through the experience, <laughs> Uh, through the through the journey, um, they, you know, may have forgotten. It, you know, some of it. You know, twenty years ago, thirty years ago. So um, they may have forgotten about that journey. So the story of finding Papa, I think, brings those memories and feelings back. So um, 
um, I think it's just great to hear people's feedback and that they were touched or if they cry. You know, I don't like to make people cry, but just hearing that they cried when they read Finding Papa, I, you know, I know that it touched them. So it's been great reception. Yeah, I, I just met with a customer in New York and um, it's a Vietnamese woman who came in the 60s for college and um, she, she, it's her first Ao Yai ever is with Garem. Um, it was something she came to look, look for an outfit for her daughter's wedding. And um, she was not thinking about an Ao Yai at all. She just wanted something comfortable. Um, and, you know, immediately when she wore it, she felt like, wow, like this is, this is me. I feel good in it. It's comfortable. <laughs> um, and, you know, with our, our, we have um, our high-waisted pants that goes with the Ao Yai that has elastic. So it's like stretchy. Um, and, um, and, you know, it makes me really happy because she was genuinely, you know, very, like very touched that she was able to wear an Ao Yai after, you know, so many decades. Hmm. Well, um, writing fiction about the Vietnam War uh, is politically complicated. So the older generation has more complicated feelings about my work, I think. Um, and I, I think it's a good number of them uh, think I'm a communist. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being a communist, uh, but that's their perception of things. And now we have the TV show coming out. And so maybe popularity will trump ideology. We'll see about that, you know, but I do know that the older actors on the TV show are very grateful and excited for their opportunities to take the stage, speaking Vietnamese, telling a Vietnamese story with all of its complications. So I remain optimistic that, you know, people will have very complicated emotional reactions. They're very controversial and traumatic situations, but that the power of storytelling will win out in the end. Maybe that's a good note to end on, you know, because we've been- I think so, yeah. Because storytellers, one in children's literature, one in fashion design, people who have also been courageous in uh, pursuing their own ideals, their own vision, their own visions, and inspiring others, right? Uh, and opening up new possibilities. And so when, when I started off talking about each of you about how rare it was to see a Vietnamese fashion designer or how rare it was to see a, a Vietnamese children's book author, the thing is that once the first or the second or the third has come out there and all of a sudden people will think, oh, it's, I can do this too. So you're a part of this transformation in Vietnamese American culture and possibility where now you're the elders. <laughs> you have people younger than you be like, oh, I can do this since these older folks have shown the way. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you so much. Yes. Had so much fun. Nice to meet you, Kathy. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. See you Thank you, everyone. So much.